Welcome back. I want to now talk about other aspects of reproduction and recruitment in the ocean. In order to do this, I need to introduce a number of other terms that relate to the typical life cycle of marine organisms. This diagram shows the life cycle of the crown-of-thorn starfish, which is typical of a large number of organisms associated with tropical coastal ecosystems. Starting on the left-hand side, spawning by adult starfish uh, occurs during the spring and early summer. And at this point, large numbers of egg and sperm are delivered into the water column by individuals that are either male or female. Now, if close enough, eggs and sperm will meet and fertilization will occur, leading to the first cell division and the beginning of larval development. Then, over about a week or so, distinctive larval stages begin to develop, not all shown here for simplicity. In this case, the larvae develop mouths and digestive systems, spending up to two weeks in the water column before they become negatively buoyant and recruit to the bottom or the benthos. Now, once they reach the bottom and receive the appropriate chemical cues, a fully grown larvae will undergo process known as metamorphosis, which is when the larvae turns into a juvenile starfish, literally over a period of one to two days. At this point, the juvenile starfish begin feeding, maturing over time until they are ready to spawn and release eggs and sperm into the water column. Now this type of life cycle is referred to as broadcast spawning. While our typical larval life cycle involves larval stages grazing on plankton, this is not always the case. There are species, for example, where the eggs are packed with lipids and proteins that are used by non-feeding larvae to fuel development. Now, in the first case, those where larvae feed on plankton, the developmental mode is referred to as planktotrophic. On the other hand, where larvae are actively using egg materials to fuel development, the larvae are referred to as lectotrophic. In some cases of lectotrophy, eggs may not be released and development occurs within special brood chambers within the parent organism. In this case, the developmental mode is referred to as brooding or brooded development. As we have already mentioned, the developmental mode can have a big influence on the length of larval life and consequently the distance over which larvae might be transported. As Shakespeare reportedly said, timing is everything. And this is certainly true when it comes to the sexual reproduction of marine organisms. Generally, spawning tends to occur such that the larvae and juvenile development occur at the most suitable time of the year. In tropical climates, this tends to occur just before the period of maximum primary productivity in the ocean. That is, when there's the most amount of food around for larvae and juveniles to feed off. How this timing occurs has captivated tropical coastal biologists for some time. After 50 years of observation and experimentation, it appears that reproductive timing is affected by factors such as age and size, the nutrition of, of spawning adults, uh, factors such as sea temperature, light levels, periodicity. And more recently, biologists have found that specific chemicals given off by members of the same species can also trigger spawning. This is important in terms of ensuring that suitably mature adults spawn at close proximity to each other in time and space. The confluence of different factors influencing how organisms have evolved to reproduce sexually has resulted in considerable diversity in terms of spawning cycles. Generally, four distinct types of spawning cycles have been identified. The first in involves situations where cycles are indistinct, with spawning being discontinuous or opportunistic. There are a number of organisms, in this case, that will spawn suddenly after a stress event, for example. Some organisms also spawn continuously without break. In these cases, spawning may depend on the nutrition of the parent generation alone. 
Many organisms within tropical coastal ecosystems are also sensitive to lunar and annual changes in conditions. Many organisms spawn on a few days after the full moon, for example, such that development and settlement can occur when light levels are lowest, ideally timing recruitment of juveniles to the benthos when the ocean is at its darkest and the best cover from predators is provided. Many organisms, as has already been stated, will be sensitive to changes in sea temperature and the maturation state of their gonads, timing their annual spawning with the period that's most productive in the ocean in order to ensure the most amount of food for larvae and juveniles. I want to now spend a little time talking about one of the most magical events within tropical coastal ecosystems. And this is the phenomenon of mass spawning. The mass spawning of animals and plants has been reported on coral reef ecosystems throughout the world. It was first reported in the early 1980s by a group of students and postdoctoral fellows working at James Cook University. Up until that time, coral reef organisms were thought to spawn on a monthly or lunar cycle, perhaps over several months during the late spring and summer. However, what this group found was truly extraordinary. Instead of spawning over several months, they reported that at least 32 species on the Great Barrier Reef were dumping their gametes into the water column over a period of a couple of nights in October and November. While this initial paper was focused on corals, subsequent research revealed that most if not all groups of organisms were spawning synchronously, or almost so, over a couple of nights following the full moon. As more and more people investigated this phenomenon, hundreds if not thousands of species were identified as being so-called mass spawners. Starfish, sea cucumbers, seaweeds, corals, and many other organisms spawn together. Mass spawning appears to occur in many other parts of the world as well, in addition to the Great Barrier Reef. Now for the interesting question. Why do so many species choose to spawn at exactly the same time. What are the advantages and disadvantages of spawning together? Have a look at the following exercise and see if you can identify the potential advantages, disadvantages and potential solutions associated with the phenomenon of mass spawning. When you come back, I want to talk a little bit more about mass spawning when it comes to reef building corals. As part of this, I want to take you to a mass spawning event and talk to some of the scientists who work on it.